So I will call this meeting of the Transportation Policy and Planning Board to order um, Monday, October 24th, 2022. Uh, if the clerk would please call the roll. Grant Foster. Here. Keith Berman. Present. Barbara Harrington McKinney. Eric Paulson. Randy Udell. Present. Chris McCahill. Here. Carolyn McAndrews. Here. Tom Wilson. Here. Balthazar DeAnda Santana. Battery Lankella. Here. Okay, hey, thank you, Ann. Um, if one of our tech facilitators would please proceed with our standard virtual meetings opening statement. Okay, welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. Members, if you are able, please activate your video for purposes of quorum and keep it on the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you're speaking. All panelists, that is alders, committee, and staff have the ability to mute and unmute themselves. Also, please continue to use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the committee, please send it to the email listed in today's agenda. Thank you. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, approval of minutes from our October 10th, 2022 meeting. Assuming all board members have reviewed those if they wanted to, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Randy, I'll take that as a second then, if you're okay with that. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving our minutes from the October 10th, 2022 meeting, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Chair Blitz unanimous, if you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, though, ground is unanimous. Thank you. Do we have any registrants for public comment for items not on the agenda? Don't believe we do. No, we don't. Okay, thank you. Are there any communications, disclosures, or recusals from members of the board? Seeing none, our first agenda item for the evening is Legislar uh, 74024, approving and adopting an updated policy for assessing street improvements citywide. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Petikowski with City Engineering, and um, uh, I think about a month ago, we came and gave a, a, a presentation, informational presentation on the updated policy. Um, we went, went to a number of different uh, uh, spots to get input al along with the TPBB and um, uh, are now here to seek approval for uh, uh, a new updated policy for the street improvements or assessments. Um, there's really uh, not too, there's really nothing different than when I was here last month. Um, so I can go over the details or just kind of answer answer some questions if there are any, um, uh, whatever you guys would prefer. So we do have a registrant for public comment. Perhaps now is a good time for that. Uh, maybe what I I'll give a a three sentence summary of the hard work <laughs> that Chris and Alder um, Foster and others did. Um, our our previous assessment policy um, required property owners uh, to pay for um, curbing, sidewalk, a lot of the expenses associated with creating a, a town road to the street. Um, this in some ways unfairly burdened, you know, residents in portions of our city that didn't have improved uh, streets. And it also basically um, created a, a property tax subsidy 
for portions of the street that were used by automobiles, but portions of the street that are used by pedestrians, uh, that had to be borne by the property owner. And um, there's a lot of details, but basically the assessment policy kind of evens it out um, so that um, portions of the city that have unimproved roadways are not disproportionately overburdened with upgrading their streets. And we kind of spread out the amount how the city subsidizes transportation. You know, you know, automobiles are supported, but but also pedestrians are supported in, in, in the way the, the costs are allocated. So maybe that's my six sentence summary of, of all the hard work that, that Chris and others have done. Thank you, Tom. Let's go to our registrant then. So we have um, a Terry Bell 1305 um, Nishishan Trail, I think I pronounced that properly, Monona, Wisconsin, in support, wishing to speak, representing the Kathy Brothers, Kathy Real Estate Brothers, partners. Excuse me. But I do not see a Terry Bell on our participants list. I think that registrant might be for the next item, but I'm not sure. Okay, it's on mine as number two, but okay. We'll move on then. Um, uh, questions, comments, discussion? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, I'll move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Second for any, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Chris, did you want to speak uh, to your motion? Um, no, I, I mean, I think as we discussed last time, um, this seems like a way to make the assessments more predictable and more evenly spread. and. Um, make it so that um, we don't, the assessments don't get in the way of things like installing sidewalks and making other improvements like that. So great work for the staff. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Any further uh, discussion, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving and adopting an updated policy for assessing street improvements citywide, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed no. Any abstentions? Chair, please unanimous. If you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, the little bit on is unanimous. Thank you. Our next item is Legislature 74140, amending the City of Madison official map to remove mapped reservations for future public streets located in the southwest quarter of the northeast quarter of Section 30 Township 8 North Range 10 East in the City of Madison on land generally assessed as 2202-23. 2-0 Darwin Road. I believe there is a registrant for this and that they wanted to sh show some graphics and I uh, have the graphics on my machine. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Did Do you think it would be appropriate for that registrant to speak um, with your graphics? Uh, yes, because they are actually his graphics. <laughs> Right. So is this Terry Bell? I can't speak to, I can't speak to them, but I can present them. So we were we worked out the logistics of how to present them. Um, so is this Terry Bell or, or Joshua Wilcox? I have them as separate items, but they they're from the same organization. I believe this would be Joshua. Okay, so we have Joshua then Joshua Wilcox, 2248 Deming Way, uh 120 Middleton, Wisconsin, in support um uh for representing the Copy Real Estate Partners. Um, without objection, we'll let this registrant speak to their um, presentation or their, their materials. All right. Good afternoon. This is Josh Wilcox with GBA, and we're representing <clears throat> Cody Real Estate Partners and their Tom. Yep, here we go. We can see them. Thank you for that. Um, just a, a quick three minutes, just kind of wanted to give everybody a quick graphical overview of the the, the history of this. So um, the area you see dashed um, with the hatch in it, that is the eight, eight acres um, at the corner of Darwin Road um, that we're referring to today. You can see the area that has a little bit lighter um, hatch to it or overlay is primary residential and everything else uh, around it is commercial. If we can go to the next slide, please. And the area that we're referring to here is zoned as a planned mobile home park. 
Um, and there's been a lot of history with this over the years. Um, and this group, uh, Clothy and some of their partners, um, one of them is an environmental justice group um, that is looking to convert this to commercial use as opposed to its mobile home um, zoned application. Um, and the city is excited about it. Um, we worked with uh, a lot of great users from an employment group as, and be able to rezone this to an SE district. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. And these are some aerials again, just so you guys can all, everybody can get a feel for it. One more slide, please. Um, lastly, so this is the exhibit that showed up um, in Legislar um, showing the, the east-west, north-south road with the bulb on the end um, that would be omitted. And so our, our rationale for this is um, we would like to be able to, to redo the CSM on this, and we are not able to do that with this road on here. This road um, is a prohibitive cost associated with the, um, the the commercial use on this site. Um, originally, it was, like we said, zoned for uh, residential use, um, whatever form that was, whether it was mobile home or not. Um, and connectivity is really important in that, that term. Here, rather, we are, if we can go to the next slide, please. We are looking to, to take that connectivity <clears throat> away from this site, um, from the rest of the mobile home, because really this site's turning into a commercial use that's consistent with what is to the east and south of it, like I showed in the original one. So this just kind of connects the dots from what you saw in the previous slide to this slide. Um, and then finally, the last slide um, is just an example of kind of where this project likely is going. Um, you know, originally we had shown a north-south road on here um, because of um, construction costs and a number of other reasons, just not feasible um, for that to work with these great users that we have lined up for this project, um, the Kothi Group does as part of this project. So with that said, that just kind of gives a high overview available to answer questions and hopefully you understand the rationale um, and how we got to this point where we are looking to um, remove those requirements for the full 66 foot wide streets. Um, both the east, west, and north, south streets associated with this parcel. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, any questions for Josh, or did staff want to add any comments before we go to discussion? Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I um, we just wanted to to add. You know, we we met with the development team. Um, my colleagues in planning and, and traffic engineering and I and um, understand the uh, concern they have. Um, I think uh, overall the, uh, you know, um, the, uh, I think we recognize the, the uh, benefit potentially for the roads, but also see the concern that uh, it has on the on the project. So I, I, I think um, in general staff is is kind of uh, amenable um, to this request. Um, one one possible alternative that uh, our, our our planning folks uh, mentioned as a as a alternative to uh, just eliminating the map altogether would be to uh, potentially um, eliminate the east-west portion of the street, but uh, leave the north-south right-of-way and and um, and dedicate that, but not require the developers to build it at this point so that it is still an option in the future if uh, if that if that may means is is seems necessary in the future but um you know we wouldn't have any any immediate plans to to uh build on that street so that that is the one alternative that our staff uh have have thought of as a as a possible um uh uh alternative to just eliminating both the north south and east west streets altogether in the map thank you chris Oliver foster go ahead please yeah, I guess um, Chris kind of spoke to my question or, or thoughts on it as well. I, I think the elimination of the East West Street um, reservation makes sense to me, but you know, given that there's already, um, I mean, I don't, I, I assume that's street that's along the um, 
kind of going along the Avis car rental um, location. There's looks like there's only about 300 feet um, that would connect it up to the East Main lane. And um, yeah, I can understand that it may not be required as part of this proposed development, but it seems to me like it would be wise to keep that north south um, street as a reservation for the future. Um, just given Packers is a really uh, tough street um for anything other than than cars especially and it does seem like it would be wise to keep at least the potential for that connectivity in the in the future so i guess it's good to hear that that was uh an alternative suggested by staff and i think that's where i would would lead with the recommendation on this as well any further questions for either josh or for staff Chris, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, I think it's just not coming together as clearly as I hoped it would. So the original street concept would have been to connect to East Main. Um, but now, I guess it's not clear what this plan is showing to me. So there would be the developer wants no street on the no or north south street or driveway there or there would be a driveway but we would relinquish the the, the ma official map um i guess it's just some, some clarification would be helpful <clears throat> and I, that could be a question for staff or whoever i guess go ahead josh or chris either one if you want to respond okay can you guys hear me? I'm not used to having been able to mute and unmute myself in these city meetings. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the request is to omit the requirement for both the east, west, and the north, south um, street. And just so we're clear, and if if we could go back a slide, I think or two, um, I think those would be helpful exhibits to maybe keep on the screen. So yeah. Oop. Nope, go back to the one that's just white. Yep, that one there. So that was what was included on Legistar. And you can see the the inverted L uh, shape there. And if we go to the next slide to the right, if you go next slide. Yeah, there you can see how that light, that L is transposed onto uh, the eight acre uh, site plan that, that we're proposing there. And so that's the rationale for it is, is that removing both of those streets would allow us to do a CSM to combine these different properties and then ultimately move forward with some form of development for the different the two different commercial users that we have in line that you know I think everyone agrees is a great use um, for this site and would be a benefit to the neighborhood. Does that help? Um, I I guess so. So there. <laughs> There was lots of like jargon and acronyms. So there would you you intend for there not to be a north south street? They would be two. Are, are they two separate parking lots as we're seeing here, or they would be combined? I'm just trying to they, they, understand they, the they, concept. They, that's a that's a very fair question, Chris. Um, you know, this plan was developed when the project was kind of in months and months ago. I'll just say that when we were looking at that that north south connection. And I, I certainly don't want to say that there will for sure be a north-south connection. It's just that the the requirement for to meet the city um, rules for a full right away, like a sixty-six foot right away. We're talking light poles, sidewalks, utilities, the whole deal. That is a very cost prohibitive requirement for a smaller commercial project like this with the type of users that are being proposed here. And so, in in its place, would likely be some type of north-south drive aisle as opposed to a street. Okay, that is helpful. Um, I don't I, did, I don't know if Tom Lynch wanted to respond to that. I My, my ahead, thought Tom. would just be that um, I agree that like, I, I think a north-south connection is still very important there. The, the type of development doesn't change that. Um, so I think preserving that on the official map uh, would make sense. Um, and I don't know the implications of that for what that road would look like and what the cost would be, but <clears throat> that'd be my, my reaction. Thank you, Chris. Go ahead, I'll foster. Yeah, I get, um, well, one asked maybe if, I don't know if one of the staff members could pull up a like satellite view of this area, because I think from what we're looking at on the other 
slide, it's not really showing that there there is an existing street network from the mobile park to the north, um, and it, it, that doesn't really show up on any of the um, slides that are in this presentation. So I guess it'd just be helpful for folks to know that there is existing streets with a um, with a gap here. Um, and then I, my question is. Um, is the current reservation solely on these parcels? So the 66 foot right of way, is that fully on this? Or, Cause typically it would, is, you know, split between the parcels. So is it not for the North, for the North South street reservation that's currently in place? Is it not actually just half of that um, with on these parcels? I guess for maybe for Chris Kudakowski or. So, this is, that was my class, and are you I'm I'm uh, checking as we uh, speak. Um, if that so while you're looking at that, I guess this is six would be on their parcel entirely, or portion on the neighbors. I'm I'm not sure. So here, I guess here you can see I, just um, I, I can, to re reinforce my point that there's already. A, I don't know if that's if that's technically a public right of way right now that's going up there or or private. But then the east main lane coming from the north as well. So you can see where there's almost connectivity there already, and that's what I would hate to abandon with taking it off the reservation. I, this aerial image isn't current. Um, there is currently a. a um, a cell tower in that corner that has certain easements associated with it as well. Um, I believe the images we had up showed that, and you could also see that in the site plan. And so that street does not actually connect or would not under the, the configuration as the CSM under its current um, language would not connect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can see that there, that there's that radio tower that's through there. Um, even even in this configuration, if let's just say that it, this was to get a full a full street, it wouldn't connect, is my understanding of it as as it would sit today. Uh, Tom, I can. How did a radio tower get built within an existing reservation? That doesn't make sense. Um, let me let me share the screen. I, I could show the current image, and uh, I did get confirmation that uh, 15 feet of that 66 would be on the neighbor's parcel. So, um, according to the map, that was uh, you know uh, approved many many years ago. Um, so here is the current layout. Um, this is not a right away right now. Um, the driveway. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the proposal would have 15 feet of, of future dedication at some time on the neighbor, mid neighboring parcel, and then, uh, 66 minus whatever, minus 15, uh, 51. thank you, um, would be dedicated on this parcel under the alternative, um, uh, and that would go to this North purple line and that does not connect to east main as of yet you know there's space in between there um right but so the, the current where that so it's a driveway today but it aligns with the current map reservation yes yeah okay well um i guess i i, I would move a recommendation to um eliminate eliminate the east west street reservation but maintain the north south uh street reservation and um also with um not requiring that the street be built out fully at this point but maintaining the map reservation second all right we have a motion and a second thank you um alder foster do you want to speak any further to your motion no i think i've shared okay then on the motion to um let me, let me just make sure I have all my Okay, um, so on the, on the motion to amend the City of Madison official map um, to remove the east-west portion, but to maintain the north-south portion, but not require a build-out of that portion. Um, all those in favor, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 
Any abstentions? Chair Blues, unanimous. If you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, they'll get on as unanimous. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Josh. Thank you all. Have a good evening. All right. Then our next item is Legistar 66898, Complete Green Streets. Okay, I think we have Renee and Adam that will go through <clears throat> uh, our presentation. Yep. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Tom, and thanks, everyone. Um, so Adam Wood from Tool Design is joining me tonight um, to do some more work on Complete and Green Streets. We have some more things to review um, and get feedback on as we work on um, finishing up this project. And I think, Adam, are you, do you want me to share my screen or you? You are, all right, perfect. We're gonna take turns tonight. So um, bear with us as we work this out. Um, but I think Adam has the first part, so I'll turn it over to him to get started. Adam. There we are. Can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the beauty of Zoom, when you share your screen, all of your controls disappear. Uh, great. Well, thanks, uh, Renee, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we have quite a few things to go through with you this evening, so I'm going to jump right in um, and show you the agenda and get started with the first bullet point. We're going to give you a bit of an update on the engagement that um, we have performed over the last several weeks, uh, talk a little bit about updates to the equity approach tell you about the green infrastructure components of the project and tree canopy component and where that's landing. Um, and then go into some detail on street design parameters. And then finally talk about a uh, an adjustment to the street types uh, that we want to propose and get some feedback from you on tonight. So dive right in and talk about the engagement update. Um, <clears throat> I first wanna hit on what we presented and, and hopefully a lot of these um, images and diagrams and graphics and so forth look familiar to you. We've shown them to you over the last year plus, um, or at least versions of this. We went through in a few different modalities, um, including a PDF online with 94 pages, I believe, of content, uh, a virtual open house or public meeting where we presented materials, and then we also had a series of focused population um, focus groups that I'll talk about a little bit. And we went through and talked about the values of the project, about the little hierarchy. We went through the decision making process and talked about how the street types relate to the overlays and how um, they help to identify priorities for a street project and how the design details, um, you know, also known as the, the, the design parameters tables, how they all relate to each other to help make decisions. Uh, we went through and talked about all six of the overlays, um, what they mean, how they're de 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 um, defined, talked about the street types, talked about the typology, um, and how there are priorities identified within them. And then uh, very importantly, talked about the equity process as well. So we went through all of these materials in, in various ways to present them to get feedback from people. Uh, so I'm going to talk first very briefly about the online public meeting. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout for this. We had 43 people that registered, uh, slightly fewer than that attended. Uh, there were also 15 additional views of the meeting video, which was posted to the project website a couple of days after the public meeting. We held a series of polls during the meeting and asked a few questions, and the results are shown here on the screen. So the, the first one is, how well do you think the values reflect what our community needs? Um, you can see that the response was positive overall for that. Um, <clears throat> majority of people said mostly nobody said that they thought it did that the values did not reflect what Madison needs. Um, in the second question, do you think that the complete green streets process reflects the street values and, and street use hierarchy that we explained? Um, again, positive uh, feedback overall. There was a little bit of, of partially um, responses in that. Um, a few people said they were not sure. Uh, we did give opportunities for people to elaborate if they said they thought only partially, and we did not really get um, much in terms of uh, responses as to why people said that. Um, and then the, the the final one to mention is, do you think the pro proposed process will lead to tangible positive impacts within the city? And again, um, the majority of people said yes, but there's a fair amount of not sure. And I, and I do wanna highlight here with, with that question and the previous one, the number of not sure responses to these polls 
is notable. Um, and I think that's in part because we are talking about a lot of new information. Um, some of the feedback we did hear verbally during the meeting was that a lot of this and people's perception is going to come down to how this is all implemented and consistency and so forth. Um, and I think it really does reflect the need for just ongoing evaluation and, and some likely adjustments to this process over time as, as we as we get in um, and work with it. And, you know, we've talked about from the beginning that this is meant to be a living guide. It's meant to evolve as the city evolves. But I do want to point out that, that no one did say no or opposed anything during the online public meeting. Okay, the population, the focus population engagement. So this is where we had four focus group sessions where we um, specifically uh, worked to engage with people of color, um, people of lower incomes to get more diversity in the input. Uh, over the course of those four sessions, we heard from 25 people. Two of those were community groups, uh, and two of them were professional associations. Uh, we these were more conversational types of meetings, so we didn't have you know polls and surveys during it. But the the summary of the discussion and the feedback we got is that this is a lot of really complex information. A lot of people said that they had never really thought about or explored the whole process of how a street ends up the way it does or all the, the factors and, and inputs that guide decisions and, and influence priorities in street design. But that, you know, they felt like they mostly understood what we were trying to get to, especially the high level piece with the values and, and the priorities and the hierarchy and so forth. The um, equity process that was proposed and the priority areas and the checklist that Renee is going to talk about uh, a little bit here in a few minutes were, re were well received. Um, but that that was um, that next bullet point. Uh, the, the, the counter to that is there is a little bit of skepticism, but but also people did express some hopefulness that, you know, we are talking about a, a, a change in the way things have happened in the past. Uh, and so being more intentional with inclusivity and equity of the outcomes of our projects is something that people are, are really excited about, but they, um, you know, want to see what, what ends up happening ultimately. Um, and I'll finally say that, especially with the two community groups we met with, uh, there was just a, a lot of interest in the nuts and bolts and the details about what we were doing. We had, um, Printouts of different right-of-way elements, so a printout of a, of a bike lane, of a terrace, of a travel lane, of a bus lane, and let people kind of play with those on a cross-section um, or a small piece of aerial uh, imagery to just kind of play with how streets come together. And there was a lot of interest in doing that. Um, and it, it was notable that these are people who said they've not really participated in design processes before. And so it, it really leads to a, a key suggestion coming out of this is that the city spend more time engaging with uh, with these communities and especially in notifying people um, to make sure people are aware that these processes are happening and not just notifying the property owners because a lot of people rent, but, you know, finding ways to really engage and notify with people that live in and around some of the, the streets that are going to be subject to, to work in the future. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk about the online survey. Um, this was posted for three weeks after the virtual public meeting. Um, unfortunately, we only had 12 participants uh, during the survey, uh, but it was, as I said, it was posted. It was uh, advertised via email uh, in, in several cases, um, but the participation was what it was. We asked a series of questions, and I've just picked out a few here just to talk a, a little bit about what we asked. Um, we asked whether people supported the guide based on what they know. We asked people to read a few statements and indicate whether they agree. Um, and we asked some questions about the equity process. And again, generally, you can see here strong support or support or people agree. So people said they support the project. People agreed that they understand the street values and motor hi modal hierarchy. People say they agree that the values reflect what our community needs. People say they agree that the modal hierarchy reflects the street values. Again, strong agreement and agreement with um, the equity process resulting in more fair and uh, equitable outcomes. Again, some uncertainty was expressed here, and you can see that with the yellow um, bars that are showing up. Uh, the only other question I wanted to point out is the um, part where we ask people to rank the importance of the different pieces of the Complete Green Streets Guide. Um, and I know those uh, the actual text under the bars are small, hard to read, so I, I kind of put some two-word 
three word uh, summaries of them. Um, the priority networks and the equity framework came up as the most important uh, to the people that took the survey. The values and hierarchy and the, the trade-offs guidance was up there as well. I think it's really interesting to note that the, the design parameters, the nuts and bolts and the visuals and the graphics and all that were some of the lower importance uh, pieces. Nothing really was uh, overwhelmingly identified as unimportant, but this is just sort of how things shook out with what people said. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Renee. All right, and before I talk about equity, I'd just say, I think um, I'm looking at, it's not surprising that we didn't have a ton of people complete the survey. It did take, it, it, I think it said it takes 20 minutes and there was, you know, we asked people to either watch the video or look at the 90 page document. So I think it is a little overwhelming. Um, there definitely were people, beyond the 15 who clicked on the video, but I didn't really count them as watching it because they only watched a minute of it, um, I think. And then they saw it, how long it was and didn't. So it is a lot to take in. And even at the meeting where people could ask questions, you know, they they told us that, you know, it's, it's hard to know, of, you know, it's hard to be positive what they thought because, you know, it, you have to think about it and sit with it. And I think that's why those small groups that we did um, with a, the BIPOC community were, you know, it's a small group, it's conversational, it's a little bit easier to really help someone understand how this might work. So now I'll jump into um, more on our equity approach, which we've talked about a little bit um, previous. Basically, the idea is that we would have these equity priority areas where we know that um, some of the resources designs have been viewed as being very different um, from a wealthier, whiter neighborhood. Um, we're proposing that we would start with the neighborhood resource teams, um, which I think most of you are familiar with those areas, but I do have a map on the next slide because there is a project going on right now that would kind of dig a little bit more into demographic data and kind of expand out what areas we might look at. And we didn't want to be ahead of that project, which is being led by the city data team right now. Um, so we thought it would be better to just start with that neighborhood resource team area and then expand out as this other project um, kind of comes to a completion and add in areas that would be determined to be appropriate and have similar demographics to what we see in the neighborhood resource teams. Because as you saw in some of the draft maps, we do know that there are some other areas that would be appropriate for kind of uh, elevated process. So basically, if you are in um, an equity priority area, you know, we would take a few additional steps um, around engagement, reviewing past input, because we definitely hear um, that people ask, they give input and they're tired of giving input because they feel like it, it doesn't get to the right people. People don't hear them. Um, so we would try to get at that in these areas. Um, and then we have this checklist that I will be talking about um, later in the presentation. So next slide. Um, so here you can see this is just the neighborhood resource teams um, in the city, and this is kind of what our starting point would be um, for considering an area, an uh, equity priority area, and, you know, we would kind of have to do a little work to make sure that, um, you know, if the border is a street, that that street is included um, instead of being like, oh, that's outside. So, you know, there'd be a little bit of a cleanup of, to make sure that this reflects the actual streets. Um, this would be kind of where we would start. Next slide. All right. Um, so this idea of a project checklist came out of, you know, how can we make sure that we're really doing our due diligence with all neighborhoods? So this checklist would be for all projects, actually. Um, it would assist people with planning and design. Um, and this framework, it would get filled out. Um, it would go onto a project website. It could go into Legistar, kind of get used to seeing it and seeing all the information um, in one place. And then it would help with reviewing outcomes um, because you would get to see the different um, projects, what got built, and ensure that going forward, if there are any issues that they're being addressed. Um, as Adam said, this document would also be living. It would potentially change over time as we get used to using it. Um, maybe we'd add things, subtract things, but it could be kind of a standard that goes along with our projects. 
right. So this is kind of a first draft, um, but the idea is you would have this checklist, you'd have some basic information so that people could look at this and know, oh, this I see where this project is, where it is located. Um, I can see the limits. I know what type it is. I know who the alder or alders are, when it's coming, what the website is and who's working on it. Next. Um, then the first section would be kind of that first phase of a project gathering data, um, which this would kind of take things that normally get presented at the Transportation Commission and put it all in one place. Um, it would include some new things like the street type, which would be a part of this project. The overlays that we've talked about is, um, you know, is this on the transit priority network, the all ages bike network, um, things like that. Um, what kinds of facilities might there be? Like would that might be schools, hospitals, senior centers, you know, those kinds of things that might influence the design. What does the street look like now? Um, and then the data that your people are used to seeing on traffic volumes, infrastructure types that are there, stormwater issues, things like that. Um, and then any neighborhood plans um, that might inform the project or other outreach that has recently taken place of that nature. So that would be the first section. Section two would be around engagement planning. So this would be kind of what is the city planning to do? Um, and then for equity priority areas, we have this whole um, ResG public participation guide. Some of you might have gone to one of the trainings the city had recently on it. And that would be used to develop um, more of an enhanced engagement plan from what we standard, kind of our standard practice is um, based on kind of what's the sky, scope and size of the project. Um, but that would all get detailed out in here. And then other city projects um, or even private developments happening within the area. And then for equity priority areas, what are the opportunities to not ask people to come to meeting lots of meetings? Like, are there some ways we can do a more broader engagement? Um, so that would be the second section. Section three would be what did we learn from those engagement outcomes, uh, particularly um, with the street type designation? Um, were there concerns raised? Are we recommending a change there? Um, and then what did we hear from people? Um, how are, are we able to address those? Um, and then what did we uh, see from the data that maybe was above uh, and beyond what we heard from the community? And then the next section would be, you know, kind of where you could put your uh, initial proposed cross section. And then um, once it's approved, you could go back in and put the final cross section. So kind of that design element. Um, and then the next section, would it be about impact and accountability? How did you let people know? Um, for equity priority areas, did we hear some sort of specific feedback that might change the process or improve it? Um, were there things that we were not able to address and what department would be able to address those? Are there opportunities there? And then kind of those design elements that support the goals of complete and green streets. Um, you know, every, things related to green infrastructure, to biking, transit, um, walking, just what did we end up putting into this project? Um, and then any other sort of important things to know about the project. And this would all be one checklist that you would see. It would get updated as it goes through the process. Um, so Legistar might start out with just the first section, then first and second, and on until it's completed. Um, and then you would have a complete file of what happened with the project um, to do reviews. All right, next. All right, um, I'm going to talk about green infrastructure next. Um, so this project is called Complete and Green Streets. Um, we started out more with the typical street um, transportation elements, but we have now been working a lot on the green infrastructure side of this and how do we bring the two together and how do we do the decision making. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. So there's two overlays that we've talked about, one relating to tree canopy and one relating more to the distributed green infrastructure. Um, we do have on the Complete and Green website a draft report um, that goes into 
Ooh, a lot of detail. I don't even know how many pages, but I do know we had to break it up into sections because it was such a hefty document and the maps are quite big. And it starts to get into how to figure out how to fit tr um, improving our tree canopy in, how to make decisions about green infrastructure, some decision-making charts. Some of those are very draft. We've uh, Staff have been diving into those and there are going to be some changes, um, a lot more flow charts coming um, for the various elements to help explain them. But this work is kind of in the thick of it right now. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? So this is about tree canopies. Um, previously, we had set a goal of 40%. Um, and what we want to do is figure out where are we kind of have a highest the highest need um, for adding tree canopy. So we have some information about our existing canopy, and we um, there are there is this online um, website treeequityscore.org where you can see a ranking of Madison um, and different parts of the city. So those kind of go into helping to decide the low, moderate, or high, and then um, there's sort of different size flex zone space needs for different kinds of streets to um, accommodate healthy trees. Um, and those will be in, they're in that guide. Um, and then there's some things that are more expensive, um, like suspended pavement. If you've been to Martin Luther King, we have what's called silver cells to help the trees um, prosper um, in that environment and kind of helping to decide where might you make that level of investment, knowing that it's very expensive to do that kind of treatment. It's better to be able to provide um, just a natural terrace space where they can grow. So trying to get at making those decisions um, to ensure that we're meeting that goal. All right, next, green infrastructure part area. This one is pretty complicated um, because there's so many different kinds of green infrastructure. You know, there's kind of the rain gardens that people maybe are starting to get more familiar with as we put more of those in. There's stormwater terraces, rock cribs. There's uh, also permeable pavements. So lots of different kinds of solutions, all having kind of different space needs and having very different costs. So this diagram that's in here is kind of a very rough uh, diagram of helping to understand if it's high, medium, or low priority for DGI um, and where there might be other um, options for non-infiltration. So for all of these different kinds of things, once you decide it's, you know, the priority is high or medium, then you kind of have to start looking at all the different options um, and how you would decide which one might make sense on a given street. So lots more flowcharts are coming um, in the very near future. Those are kind of in process trying to use both, you know, looking also at like things like maintenance, because some of them have some pretty high maintenance expectations. So, you know, maybe that's not the first thing that you would go to if there's some other options that would fit in that scenario. So that is all um, being worked on by kind of engineering streets and um, others who are involved in that process uh, to get all that built out. But there's kind of a, some starting documents on that website if you would like to um, look at that report in more detail. And I think um, the Board of Public Works will be hearing more about this in November as well as we start to build those out. All right. Um, Adam, did you want me to talk about parameter tables or were you? Uh, how about I get us started and then okay. you can get some detail in there. Um, this diagram has been used a couple of times where we have uh, sort of described the overall process. You know, this Complete Green Streets, one of the things that's really challenging about putting it into a single document or putting it into a single PowerPoint or whatever is that it's really not fully a linear process, there's a lot of iterative aspects to it when you look at the street types and the overlays and priorities and kind of have to go back and, and around in circles a few times to figure out how you ultimately end up with a street design. Um, so this diagram is illustrating the role of these parameters tables in the purple box, which is that they're really the technical design details. Once you've selected a street type, you've identified the overlays, and you've kind of figured out what's more important here on street parking versus more space for trees versus this versus that, um, 
that's then when you can look at the parameters tables and figure out how wide should our parking be at minimum? What's the what's the sort of narrowest parking lane we can get away with? What's the widest travel lane we should put in? Um, what's the appropriate design speed for a street? All of those sorts of things. So this is, you know, really kind of the meat uh, where the rubber meets the road, whatever sort of euphemism you want to use is where this all really starts to get very specific into detailed designs. So this is broken down into a few different tables. And these are, if you remember the street zone color coding of the orange and the teal and the purple, these are kind of color coded to go along with that. Um, this first table is identifying the travel ways. This is that part of the roadway where the movement is happening. So this is where motor vehicles, transit, and on many street types uh, where biking is occurring. Uh, you can see the rows are for the different street types. Um, and so this is identifying your typical conditions. And you can see some places where it says typical, some places where it says maximum, minimum, and so forth. Uh, generally speaking, we want to strive for a four travel lane total maximum on a lot of these streets. And I know we've had conversations about this in the past. Uh, we want to default to four lanes. That would be two in each direction. This is leaning more toward narrower travel lanes, which has a, a variety of benefits from uh, kind of the natural traffic calming effect of a narrower lane. It saves space to provide you know, room for other types of uses uh, as well. It identifies whether a center turn lane or median is standard or optional. Um, and then, as I said, the design speed. And you can, again, see the speeds are lower. Some of these elements, when we were talking about typology earlier this year, we talked about things like design speed. But this is sort of taking it in and, and codifying it a little bit more. Renee, is there anything on this table that you wanted to add or mention specifically? Not specifically. I think that um, kind of sums it up. I tried to kind of break these up a little bit to hopefully make them a little bit. Um, more easier to understand. So this is a related table. Um, again, the rows are the street types, but this identifies the total pavement width. Um, and then sort of typical configurations that you might see here. So this is, again, meant to, to serve not as a set of hard and fast rules for how streets should be designed, but as starting points um, that are appropriate given various, you know, context factors and so forth. Yeah, um, and, you could, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that you can see that there is a range of widths. Some of these have greater ranges than others, um, especially when you get to some of the street types at the top where there is a, a wider range of potentially traffic volumes and existing conditions. Things like neighborhood streets are going to be a little bit more consistent in terms of their layout. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, I kind of added the right hand side of the chart because there are a lot of different types of even a neighborhood street. Um, and we kind of wanted to help kind of illustrate what that would look like under different scenarios so that you could start to visualize it a little bit more. This slide then gets into the flex zone itself, which is again, that space between the travel way and the walkway, the flex zone can be part of the terrace. It could be part of the on-street parking. Uh, this identifies a typical width and a typical minimum. You can see that it says typical minimum. This doesn't mean that this is the absolute minimum, but this is generally what we want to aim for. Um, on a lot of these, the typical can be wider. If you have a lot of extra right of way for whatever reason, and the flex zone is a high priority. So say, for example, on a, um, a, a neighborhood or sorry, a community main street, if you have enough room to do a 12 or 14 foot wide flex zone, maybe maybe do that. That may give you more space for sidewalk cafes or, or, or what have you. Um, this does get into a lot of detail about the motor vehicle parking. Um, and how to uh, accommodate that into each of these street types, whether it is uh, a typical piece to include or not. And, and importantly gets into doing insets into the terrace where the parking takes precedent over terrace and so forth. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, we, we could have just said, oh, you know, is parking typical or not typical? Um, we tried not to, put it in necessarily we did put it in um 
you know, like the mixed use ones, because that is likely to be included. Um, but definitely that could be shown without it as well. Um, but we didn't want it to feel like, oh, it's just typical that you have parking on a street um, instead of it's it's maybe not typical that we would have parking on a street. Okay, and then we get uh, last but certainly not least into the walkway. Again, a, a preferred and typical minimum. And then you can see, again, the more uh, contextualized, typical uh, descriptions on the right-hand side of how wide we would like to have a sidewalk and what the minimum may be. Some of these have a lot more sort of nuance and detail into them. For example, a parkway is a common place where we might have a shared use path along the roadway instead of a sidewalk on, on one or both sides. Okay, anything else, Renee, on the... No, I think this one is maybe the most sort of, other than the parkway, which has got, you know, maybe more kind of differences. They're pretty straightforward. One thing I will point out, if you um, are, are looking at this and seeing some potential discrepancies of a five foot sidewalk, it's as a typical minimum of six feet per walkway width. I do want to point out that the the preferred and typical minimums do include a buffer to the right of way edge. So this could include a, an offset from a building if the building is built up to the property line, offset from a fence or a, a, a decorative wall along a neighborhood or something along those lines. Okay, um, and then the final section is a discussion about some adjustments that we're proposing to the street typology. Um, down at the bottom right corner of this matrix that we've shown you um, probably a dozen times or more, we have two street types that are, are sort of similar but have some differences. Um, the neighborhood yield street is a neighborhood street in constrained conditions where there's not enough space for two cars to pass each other you know, at full speed for the roadway. Uh, it does require one to pull over to yield somehow to get through. Um, this is a, an appropriate street type in places where there's constrained conditions, but it may also be a desirable street type to construct because it lends a more natural traffic calming um, type of situation. Not compatible with a transit route um, for various reasons, but, um, you know, is, is something that'll be present on a lot of streets within the city. The neighborhood shared street, you could see how we had identified this as applying to the many court streets that are in the city. We had previously talked about this uh, ref uh, reflecting some of the European style shared streets that are curbless or have a variety of other design features. In numerous conversations and discussions, we've kind of come to the realization or understanding that there are some challenges with this and it, and it makes it a little bit harder to sort of identify the best way to approach the court streets and also the best way to give us the flexibility and opportunity to do a more innovative um, shared street type of design in a neighborhood. So the current situation is we have the court streets really um, as identified as neighborhood shared streets and we've designed the graphic in such a way to really look like a court street and indicate what the preferred conditions would be. However, we're also showing people walking in the street and, and identifying the entire uh, pavement as the flex zone. Uh, as you can probably tell, those of you that have uh, experienced or are familiar with some of the European style shared streets, this doesn't really reflect some of the more design intensive uh, concepts that are out there. What we're suggesting now is to take that graphic and I'll flip back and forth just briefly and see, you can see that there's not a whole lot that's changed other than some of the color coding um, and really consider those court streets as being a neighborhood yield street in constrained conditions. Um, the travelway is then identified. This then would have uh, more defined parameters for um, the, the flex zone width and so forth and would have some description discussion in there, uh, identifying the conditions in which a sidewalk uh, may be placed against back of curb, which is not ideal, but is necessary in some situations or when we may only have a sidewalk on one side. What that then does is open up the ability for the neighborhood shared street to better reflect the more, um, you know, design intensive sort of innovative approach to the shared spaces. 
But there are a few um, constraints and considerations here. Again, when we talk about maintenance and accessibility needs on these streets, especially in a climate like ours, where we do have a lot of snow and ice. Uh, so these would be places that would be designated as a pedestrian mall, um, that would allow the broader traffic restrictions to exist, but that then comes with some uh, additional requirements in terms of having maintenance agreements for really pedestrian-oriented snow and ice removal. So that's probably more like brush-style removal, like you see on um, you know various downtown uh, sidewalks and, and so forth. Um, places where there's consolidated trash pickup, so we don't have to have garbage trucks going down these streets to pick up the trash barrels and have trash barrels further, you know, constraining an already tight right of way. Um, and then looking at, uh, you know, cross streets and alleys for additional fire access. Um, <clears throat> what this also would mean then is not having the same style of graphic because the shared street is, you know, really could be a highly flexible design. And we don't want to necessarily default to a starting point of design right now. Um, again, this reflects more of a holistic um, design approach and neighborhood-based uh, planning and design approach. So it's probably something that would be seen more in new neighborhoods or you know, larger scale redevelopments or something along those lines. Renee, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that, you know, just the big thing is, you know, that last bullet, like looking at the context, not just of the street, but the entire neighborhood and how traffic is going to flow to ensure the success of this. Um, I think it's kind of a big point in some of the information that's out there, um, particularly coming out of Europe is, you know, you can't plan this as just this standalone item. Um, so I think, you know, just broadly thinking about that. And then the other part is just the first part is, you know, thinking about the legal issues of us here in the U.S. and what the state statute is in Wisconsin and how we can work with that to ensure that, you know, we're setting up it up in a way that is also um, defensible. All right. Uh, I guess I can talk a little bit about next steps. Um, so we have, you know, work on the decision making framework. Um, a lot of it um, is related to green infrastructure, but also kind of how all those pieces fit together. Um, so refining that, um, finalizing the project checklist, um, making updates um, to the overlays that we've kind of been collecting um, from the engagement that we've been doing. Um, we have to finalize the street design element tables. We um, didn't have one to show which you would have seen kind of maybe in some of the drafts, a right of way table that kind of relates to all the zones. Um, going to the Board of Public Works to review more on the green infrastructure and tree decision making side. Um, and then coming back on November 14th um, with more of these pieces put together um, as kind of our next steps. And I guess we're to the, the feedback section where we'd really like to kind of hear um, your thoughts on some of these pieces. It can be related to things that maybe you've been thinking about that are related to things that we talked about before, but just want to, you know, have an opportunity to collect all that so we can um, start putting it together as we build out the final documents. All right. Thank you. Um, questions, feedback? Alder Foster, go ahead. Thanks for the update. Uh, it's a lot of good work. On the um, proposal for the website with info for street projects, would that be for all street projects moving forward, or was that just a subset? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think, you know, definitely larger projects, so reconstructions, resurfacings, um, not for like the tiniest little project. So I think, you know, we're still trying to figure out like where is that cutoff point, but something that's going to the TC, yeah, that's gonna be on the list if it's kind of a standalone project. Um, there might be instances where a larger Safe Streets Madison project, it might make sense to fill it out, but probably not like small bump outs, crosswalk improvements. So, you know, kind of we'll have to feel our way through what size of project a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that makes sense. I would probably encourage sort of more stuff rather than than less stuff. Um, it's 
just as an alder, it's it's really helpful to have a place to point people. Um, I know the the street projects that I've had that have had a project website. Um, it's just it's really helpful for everybody to get those updates on there to, to post information. So I like that a lot. And I, um, so I, I think it'd be great to have those at least for the, for the sort of regular street projects. And then like you said, any kind of larger um, other projects makes a lot of sense. Um, the equity priority areas, I know you, you shared that there's sort of a, another project in the works to, to maybe better define that. Um, I don't know what the proposed timeline is for that at this time. I know things have a tendency to <laughs> take a lot longer than we might all want. Um, I, I mean, I feel pretty uncomfortable with the NRTs being a stand-in for that. I know it's kind of what we have. Um, I don't know if the environmental justice areas that the MPO uses would be another thing to consider. Um, I just, I don't think that the, our currently defined NRT areas is not really a good representation of our um, environmental justice areas within the city. And then I think the second issue I have is when we're talking about transportation network, to me, we really need to be focused on what projects or what gaps in our transportation infrastructure are going to impact disproportionately certain groups of people in certain neighborhoods. Um, and those aren't always going to be the ones that are within or even adjacent to a neighborhood where folks live particularly, right? So I think of some of the really important projects like the West Main, um, you know, improvements where we have a critical connection from the South side to downtown. It might technically run through the Bay Creek neighborhood and you say, well, this, you know, this is a well-off neighborhood. So it's not an, a, you know, a high equity project where I think in fact it is. So I guess I would just continue to, look at that and make sure that we're not we're not stopping ourselves from prioritizing or having even you know higher engagement for projects that are going to have a high impact to communities that we know um you know should have more attention um so i guess just let's maybe continue to think a little bit more expansively on that and not get ourselves in a spot where um you know it only qualifies if it's a street specifically within an nrt neighborhood um on the green infrastructure, it sounds like there's still a lot of work happening there. Um, one thing I didn't see in any of the materials presented today that I think is really critical is um, distinguishing between um, kind of the you know the, the more constrained streets versus the less constrained, which you know generally is going to be arterials collectors or you know equivalent in the in, in the new framework where there's a lot of competing needs and we're trying to squeeze everything in versus those local streets where we're not. And I think it, to me, it's really worth calling that out that, um, you know, if it is an arterial and we're, we're already struggling getting in a bus lane and bike lanes or wider sidewalks or whatever the case may be, it, I think we should be clear that that's going to be the last place that we're trying to also force trees into, even if it happens to be in, um, you know, a zone where we want to see more trees. But the side streets, you know, in that same area are ones where we're going to absolutely prioritize getting that green infrastructure in. So I think um, it might be worth calling that out a little bit more specifically. Uh, a question I had on the width charts, the typical width charts, um, it looks like I didn't see any of them referring to the right of way width, you know, more just the sort of travel lane or other things. I know... Um, I mean, obviously, if it's for a, a reconstruction project where we already have a defined right of way, that's you know that that's the valuable piece. But I I, th I know we've also seen a lot of opportunities or missed opportunities around right of way definition for new neighborhoods. So that feels like an area where um, I'm guessing engineering and others would really appreciate having a table, um, you know, to be able to look at and say what's what's the actual right of way that we should be asking for um, or, or, you know, requiring in CSMs and, you know, replattings that, that take into account the kind of infrastructure that we're looking for in that complete, um, complete streets framework. Um, oh, go, if, yeah, you. yeah, I can jump in on the right away. So that's, you know, obviously all the other zones get to kind of figure those out first and then the right away. So when we come back, we should have all the right of ways we are, I'm um, just getting to that next step is um, the right of ways that would go with each street type. So you are correct. That is very valuable. 
Perfect. <laughs> um, on the neighborhood street versus the neighborhood yield street, um, I, I like the sort of discussion around neighborhood yield versus, I forget, neighborhood yield constrained or what, you know, I, I think that's interesting. Um, I'm also just really interested in the guidance around, like, why would we want a neighborhood street versus a neighborhood yield street? Um, I feel like we've, we've let sort of constraints guide us. We're like, oh, if we don't have enough room for a 30 foot or 32 foot neighborhood street, then here's how we manage this sort of constrained environment. And I think in reality, probably a lot of us on, on this call today know that those yield streets are just flat out better. I mean, they're, they're better for pedestrians. They're better for keeping speeds down. And so I'm, I'm, I think was really hopeful. I'm hopeful that this can help move us towards sort of constraining ourselves. Um, and so like, you know, my street's 32 foot curb to curb and there's just no reason for it. And I would love it to be the 18 foot. So is there a way that we can either give better definition around that and ideally get us in a place where we're, you know, the default should be, it's a yield street and there needs to be a case made for why we would want a 30 foot wide or a 32 foot wide neighborhood street. If it's got low volumes, um, you know, why isn't maybe our standard to constrain ourselves and to kind of push ourselves into that yield street environment? Cause it just feels like that's more consistent with, where we're trying to go with um, lower speeds and, and ped safety. So I um, would be curious, any thoughts on that one? Um, a couple other quick comments the, in the flex zone um, chart, it looked like a lot of them said, you know, add eight foot for parking. Um, I mean, maybe this is obvious or it, it already comes out, but I think in a lot of those, if you've got, um, if you don't have those already, I, I think in some cases we're actually probably going to only need to add six feet you know, if there's a two foot gutter pan there, that would be part of the, the parking zone as well. So maybe just reviewing that and making sure that we're not adding more space than, than we need to if, um, if the gutter pan's already um, part of the existing. Um, you spoke to the sidewalk minimum six versus six foot versus five. I get the point about sort of an extra foot, but it, I think it is really confusing to have like preferred versus minimum. And we're, I mean, we're generally, I think, going to continue to do the five foot sidewalk. So Maybe just think about a way to rep to present that that doesn't set up maybe false expectations that oh we should have six but we're only doing five because I, I mean unless there's unless we're planning on changing that it, it just was a little bit confusing um, and that, yeah actually that was my last comment but um, really appreciate all the work and it's it's looking really good thank you all right uh, Alder Hang McKinney you're up next go ahead please. Okay, thank you very much, and I apologize for joining late. Um, I want to go back to, Renee, you had mentioned a high equity network. Could you say a little bit more about that? And the reason that I, I want to have a better understanding is, is that um, when uh, my colleague talked about the NRTs, and the NRTs seem to be the um, uh, the entity that touches the uh, most non-represented population. I'm noticing in the NRTs, they are staff run and also they uh, request a staff presentations to come in and really explain and break it down so that they can understand it. And so um, could you tell me how that's going to be moving forward? I, I heard a lot of technical things, but I just want to kind of break it down to understand how is it reaching uh, which neighborhoods it will reach. Sure. So first off, I think the idea is that we would start, we had proposed, you know, kind of starting on a larger scale. Um, but there is a project that the data team is leading to kind of look at um, neighborhoods and kind of do a deeper dive into, you know, kind of these racial equity, social justice areas beyond the neighborhood resource team. So we kind of felt like it might be better to wait for that. Now these can take a while, so I don't think we would want to wait forever, but it felt like starting with neighborhood resource teams was kind of a safe bet and then adding in from there. Um, and I think Alder Foster makes some good points about obviously the influence of transportation doesn't end at your neighborhood boundary. It's bigger than that. Um, 
So definitely giving some thought to how that might work with this. But I think ideally we would add some new areas um, that kind of meet the metrics of what the city means by racial equity and social justice. Those areas um, that have been sort of determined would be used um, not just for this project, they'd be used for other projects um, as well. And then we would, in those areas, you know, we would look at more of an enhanced engagement, like going above and beyond kind of the standard process that we might use in an engaged neighborhood. Um, and we would use that residue public participation guide to build out what that looks like. Um, and it would be a little different for every project. Then we would look for more opportunities um, to sort of bundle together engagement, um, where if there's a park project and a streets project going on, you know, working together to build out an engagement plan. Um, and ensuring that we have really good follow-up um, as well, both from things that we could solve and things that perhaps need to get into a budget um, or, you know, get on a work plan for another department. So I think that's kind of the idea of what would happen um, and that, you know, it would be kind of a, a learning as we go as well, like what's working, what are we here isn't working, um, so that we could build out a process that feels like we get better outcomes across the city. Does that answer your question at all? <laughs> it, it it does. And I um, it, it was not intended to throw yeah. a wrench, but I just yeah. wanted to make sure that it stays in the game plan. I, I don't want it lost. Yeah. Um, and maybe it doesn't fit just now into the techno pieces that you described today, but I just don't want it to be pushed so far to the end that it's lost, that discussion is lost. And when you get down to those micro areas, it is where um, transportation can present it where it's understandable. I just didn't want it to mm -hmm. fall over the cliff, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I mm -hmm. appreciate it. All right, thank you. Um, Chris, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, I think I'll say the same thing I might say every time, which is um, I appreciate seeing the work that's been done so far. Things become a little clearer every time more of the pieces come together. Um, one of those is the engagement piece. Um, you know, I think early on I was trying to figure out how, you know, if the engagement process pointed to people wanting parking and the hierarchy says that's not a priority, what happens? And I think I can sort of see the answer to that coming through here, where it's, you know, a, a matter of asking right, the right questions, getting the right data, and figuring out what, where to go from there. So um, I appreciate that. And I also like seeing the um, the parameter, parameter tables. I think this is sort of getting at, like, how do we incorporate, like, NACTO guidelines and things like that into the process from the start so that we don't have to hash them out at transportation commission every time. Um, so that's great. Um, I, listening to Alder Foster talk about like the, um, the right of ways and things like that. Um, I am, I, I'm wondering if you're, if, if you're lean or leaning on or know of good guidance on things like that. And one thing that comes to mind is I know ITE has, um, recommended practice on walkable urban thoroughfares that talks a little bit more about, you know, the relationship of the street to um buildings and stuff like that so um just wanted to flag that maybe as one of the resources you may or may not be be leaning into already um one question i had um a little more detailed one comes to the um the uh sh the constrained streets which i think probably there's not a lot of them but they're very interesting to think about um and the concept, um, Adam, that you showed, the change that you made in the drawing seems to suggest to me that there is clear delineation between uses of that space. Like, I think you've made it sort of look more as though there is a space for cars and a space for parking and a space for walking. Although I heard, it sounded like you were describing the opposite of that, where we maybe want to create um, the flexibility that that is just a shared space, like the the picture that you showed, which I think was Cambridge, maybe. So can you talk me through your thinking on that? Like, are we moving in a, which direction are we trying to go with those? 
I think, you know, the, the intent of it really is to get us to a point of better clarity, um, where the, the rub that we started to feel, and I'll just share my screen again, because I, I either have to gesture or point at something in order to speak. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, um, the road that we started to feel was talking about shared streets, places where maybe there's not that much delineation between people walking and biking and, and car traffic, where the car traffic is intended to go very slow, 15 miles per hour maximum, preferably slower than that, um, play streets, that sort of thing, um, as as being an ideal, but it not necessarily being something that is going to be the reality in some of these retrofitted court streets. So there's a number of court streets, uh, you know, within a lot of the pre-war neighborhoods in Madison that do have a defined curb and gutter and stormwater, uh, storm sewer system and things along those lines. They're going in and retrofitting more of a flush street or something with the, the sort of brick paver sort of situation like you might see in some of those, these photos from Cambridge and whatnot, it's unlikely that we're going to go in and, and reconstruct a street in this manner um, and in a manner that's going and, and have the situation where we can somehow get the commitment to have, you know, the, the, the type of maintenance needed to make this safe and comfortable and compliant during the winter with snow clearance and so forth. So it's recognizing that and saying, let's just actually, instead of trying to shoehorn the court streets and this potential future option together into one bucket, let's split the court streets out and put it back into the neighborhood yield street and just recognize that it's more in a constrained situation. So yes, this is showing more defined travel way and so forth. And, and part of that's just in recognition that, you know, while people may end up walking in the street, just like on neighborhood yield streets, that happens quite a bit, um, that, that it's going to be, you know, visibly a little bit more like the neighborhood yield street in terms of its overall design and aesthetic and things along those lines. So it's it's kind of taking the court streets out of that in order to allow that neighborhood shared street to evolve into more of a, um, you know, unique, nuanced kind of design like this is showing. Does that kind of help explain? Uh, yeah, it does. Thanks. Um, I guess I just don't want to, I want to make sure that we are still leaving space for that ideal in, in the right cases. So, you know, the, the, the court street as it is imagined as sort of the shared space winner thing. Yeah. Uh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> or any additional questions or feedback? All right, seeing none. Um, thanks, Adam. Thanks, Renee. Thanks everyone else who contributed to this. And then we will move on. Our next, our next item is Legistar 74347, um, TPPB uh, 2023 meeting schedule. So continuing discussion from last week. Yes, I'll, um, I'll start perhaps just by, I. Uh, Incorporated a, um, let me, a new item in the Legistar. Um, we have um, what's here shaded in light orange is what the group agreed to adopt last meeting tentatively. Um, this has pretty much the same information, except I, I took out the options. And I, right now, the Transportation Commission is also developing a, a draft schedule. So um, that's shown as well uh, adjacent to it. Um, the conflicts that I could readily identify um, are in red. Uh, we have three, it looks like we have three conflicts with uh, Finance Committee and one conflict with Plan Commission. Um, that's m mostly what I could find, um, but I want to acknowledge that you know I was just doing it by by observation and not by a computer. So there there may be one or another conflict that I I did not catch. 
Thanks, Tom. Um, any thoughts? Now that we've had a couple weeks to digest this. Sorry, I switched over, getting ready for my next sure. my next agenda item. Shall we then just adopt it as our official? Need a motion to do that. Go ahead, Chris. I was just going to ask if you need a motion. Yeah, move adoption. Thank, thank you. Second. Audrey, thank you. Any discussion? Obviously, we'll deal with the complex as they come. And there may be one or two changes in there, but we will give as much notice as we can so folks have a time to adjust. All those in favor of adopting um, our currently tentatively adopted schedule for 2023, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Aye. no. Chair, please unanimous. If you'd like to destroy a no vote or an abstention, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, we'll get on as unanimous. Thank you. Our last item for the agenda, excuse me, for the agenda this evening then is Legistar 72614, Director's Report. Time you're up once again. Yeah, I'll um, I'll just uh, give some highlights. Um, the the signed contract for the we just got the signed contract for the BRT early works. Uh, which is a big deal. Uh, we're hoping for a groundbreaking ceremony sometime mid December ish. Um, that's that feels. I'm just gonna say that feels pretty good. Um, this Thursday, um, the main BRT package goes out to bid. Uh, that's the largest BRT package, um, and where you will see the most. We are hoping to receive bids December sixth. Um, and then it would uh, be probably approved by Common Council the first meeting in January. Um, probably all of you know that the construction industry is going through a lot of um, price inflation, right? And so it's uh, every every sector in the infrastructure economy is, are trying to adapt and address rising costs. Uh, so. Um, that's occurring with roadway projects, uh, building projects and the like. Uh, we've made several, um, you might say, adaptations, but you know, we'll see how the bids come in. We are, we're hopeful, but we are ex expecting changes. And I think anyone that is bidding anything right now is expecting changes. Uh, parking, the parking manager um, has been reposted. Um, we're hoping for a good group of candidates. We're continuing to work with the developer on the inner city bus terminal and the State Street campus uh, garage replacement. And then um, we're going to have a, a transition in leadership with our PEOs. Uh, Stephanie Neeson's been an excellent PEO supervisor, but she'll be moving to a different position within uh, traffic engineering. Uh, she'll do a lot of good there, but you know that's another change that we'll have to deal with internally. Um, federal funding. Uh, we submitted for inside of two months. We've submitted for for about four different um, federal grant programs. Um, these all required a, a fair amount of effort. Uh, Railroad crossing elimination program, uh, the safe streets for all, um, the reconnecting communities, and um, also a, a bridge program to help with John Lone Drive bridges. So we're hoping we're hoping for a couple of those are successful, not just one, but a, a couple would be nice. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting. It, we've never seen so much federal um, funding uh, come out on the, on the table, um, but then with that comes uh, the increased effort to try and capture that funding. Right? Um, Wisdot projects are, are I'm going to say continuing forward, but there's not a lot of new information. They did Stoughton Road did have a, a public information meeting. Um, I think last week, just collecting people's general comments. Uh, the Transportation Demand Management Ordinance, uh, we are hoping to introduce that November 1st. Uh, we need um, some things done by the attorney's office. We think that's all set. Um, as you can tell, on the complete green streets from Ren what Renee and Adam showed, there's a lot of work that's been going on in that. Um, we still have to kind of put the body more of the flesh 
you know, on, on the things, but um, a lot of work. We would like to have that introduced this year. And then um, as far as uh, Amtrak, um, we, we've had two or three meetings with the consultant. We'd like to have just a very brief initial public meeting, perhaps early December, um, with more the majority of the work occurring in the earlier part of next year. So that's that. Is there any questions or comments on that? Anything for Tom? Doesn't look like it. Thanks, Tom. All right. All right. Um, that's all we have for the evening. Look for a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Carolyn. All those in favor of adjourning the, the meeting for the evening, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. It was unanimous. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Good night.